the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, yes. Uh, welcome to Meaning of Catholic. Timothy Flanders. Jesus is King. I'm joined today by Louis Gafari. Louis, how are you doing? Great. Thanks, Timothy, for having me on. Yes, it's a pleasure to have Lewis with us. Lewis is the, uh, are you the CEO of Romanitas Press? I'm the owner. The yeah, owner, I'm creator, the founder. Usher, you know, whatever. Innovator. Okay, great. So tell us about, um, before we get into our topic, tell us about Romanitas Press. Uh, I'm going to pull up the website. You get, you can sure. tell tell viewers where to go on this uh, website here. So RomanitasPress.com. Tell us about it. Yes. So Romanitas Press, what we, what I uh, do there is uh, we offer a whole variety of things. So obviously we do some publishing, the word press, um, mainly dealing with traditional uh, Roman liturgy. Um, there's also other things that are related to that to some degree. Um, architecture as well, liturgical architecture, um, even catechism, a Roman Catholic drill book. Um, so a lot of great things in there. Um, and then also on the other side of things, I do uh, consultative training work, whether it's for altar servers, priests. You see behind me, in fact, it's all set up for one of the priest webinars that I give where I actually teach priests how to say traditional mass. And we, we go through that's a whole 12 week um, curriculum, actually, that we do um, courses for our servers um, and a lot of more things are being developed in that respect. Um, in, in for that style of work. Also, we're working on, hopefully this year, we'll finally get to actually making videos, training videos. We've been trying to get to this for several years. Um, so hopefully this year, this summer, it's going to become a reality. We start creating training videos um, for the altar servers and possibly even for the priests, sacristans, those kind of things. I also do consultation work in um, regards to um, architecture, liturgical arts. So recently just assisted with a uh, a church has been a two-year project, St. Peregrine's Church out in the Cleveland area. They just left the church, consecrated the altar, and I've been involved in all the design aspects of the interior. It's been a, an enormous, um, very uh, rewarding project, in fact, um, on many levels. Um, also uh, doing other consultation work for um, people who are just trying to get to know how to do things correctly. And, and I do conferences. Um, I've, I've been a speaker, I've been a writer, I've been an author, um, and uh, trying to maybe eventually get into some podcasts as well, too, to talk about various liturgical matters. So, a little of everything. Sweet. Excellent. Well, it sounds like you're doing great work providing that video resource to many souls, priests, as well as everyone involved in the altar in any way. Um, and you noted, you noted before we went on, this section right here, you're gonna. I think you're gonna reference during this conversation under info media. If viewers go to info media, there's a section called liturgical documents. Yes. Uh, so Lewis has a bunch of these documents here, uh, which would get into a lot of our our topic, on, which is the which is the reform of Pius the twelfth. Uh, so here's a lot of. There's more coming too. Excellent. So. Great. Yeah. So we're, we're gonna get into our topic in just a minute. Just a just an announcement for all the um, guild members. We'll have our guild patron stream tomorrow at around 3 30 p.m that's just going to be open discussion anybody want to talk about anything comment and ask your questions uh we'll also have benedict vindicates the trads tomorrow we'll also have a two shows god willing on saturday too so um and then on monday we'll have uh can men play video games at tariff demons that'll be fun right all right will be the atari 2600 but what was that is that going to be the Atari 2600? Yeah, that's the only one that's allowed to man, I think. Okay, that's, that's good. The most manly version, yeah. There you go. So uh, so today is the Holy Week reform, or rather the 1955 reform uh, of Pius XII. Um, this is originally, Kennedy told me about your show with Kassman. And so uh, Lewis did two shows on this um, with Kassman. They're linked below, Jeff Kassman. Um, and it was something that was going contrary to what seems to be more of a general opinion among most trads. I'm not sure if that's, if that's true or not, but certainly in my experience. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to cover this and get a different perspective, which I, I'd never heard before from Lewis. 
Uh, but I wanted to do it after Holy Week because we can just yeah. focus on Holy Week and, yes. and pray during Holy Week. Yes. And we can, you know, debate about stuff later, which right. this is kind of a good time. Yes. Um, but also, the, it also has to do with the Pentecost vigil. So it actually is connected to the very end of Paschal Tide, too. Um, so I, let me just uh, start off, Lewis, with the, the basic, the general ex- objection that I've ever seen uh, on, on the 1955 liturgical reform is essentially the assertion that the 55 reform was operating, it's, it's, it's a uh, compared to the Novus Ordo, it's very minor, but it's it, the assertion is that it's on the same principles as the Novus Ordo in terms of um, antiquarianism, uh, a very uh, a strong emphasis on active participation in a bad way. Uh, so, what is your main response to this general assertion that the principles are the same between these two reforms? Well, they're not. They're absolutely diametrically opposed to each other because the line in the sand is orthodoxy versus heterodoxy. This is the point that Archbishop Lefebvre made to the State of Acontis Nine back in 1983 when he had to expel them. It came to the head because of liturgical matters, their State of Acontis spirit, their State of Acontis mindset. And he had attempted to talk to them about this. And you can Google it when, only when the faith is in question. Just Google that and it'll pop up. This is the conference he gave to the seminarians at Ridgefield after the expulsion of the nine, explaining to them why does the SSPX um, insist on using the 1962 liturgical books, the Misale Romanum, which includes the Holy Week reform, the breviary, the ritual, and all those things, okay? And by the way, Archbishop Lefebvre, some people said, well, they're only doing this because Archbishop Lefebvre, actually, he didn't start doing this until 1974. They were using the 65 missile before that. He was actually preceded by Univoce International in 1965-66, Latin Mass Society of England and Wales, um, the Dominicans of Fanjo, and they brag about this, by the way, uh, and others. They had already made this look, this call, it's the 62 missile that we need to follow. The 65 is the 62 textually with some omissions and some rubrical changes, but it's still orthodox. It's just what came later with the 65 was they allowed the uh, Episcopal conferences to make all kinds of additions and variations and options. And by the way, as an example, the first guitar masses start with the 65 missile. It okay. start with the Novus Ordo. So Archbishop Lefebvre was like, look, this, he said, as Michael Davies defended several years ago, the 62 missile is a rock of stability. It doesn't have all those issues that go with it. Um, and so this is why, you know, he's not the only one. And of course, this is later verified or certified by not only from the time of John Paul II with the 84 indult, but then going forward to Pope Benedict XVI and even Pope Francis, the Ecclesia Dei communities, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so let, let, let me just let me just clarify just for viewers if yeah. they're not familiar with these different dates and everything, um, because if I recall, actually the Agatha Christie indult was for the sixty-five. Uh, if I if I'm not mistaken, it, uh, it was for the traditional mass, and it wasn't. Um, it wouldn't have been for the sixty-five because by nineteen seventy, the groups that are promoting the Agatha Christie indult. Which, by the way, I'm very glad that document's resurfaced again because it's a very important seminal document and it's often been forgotten in the midst of uh, the history of the traditional movement. So I'm so glad that that's been brought back out, um, this early resistance. But uh, this document comes out in 1970 and by this time already, these same groups are following the 62 missile. Okay, so so I was using the 65 until... 1974 is that what you said? Archbishop Lefebvre was using the 65 missile at Icone for the public okay. masses, and then they switched back to the 62. And 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 by the way, the other the other thing that often gets that's misunderstood is some people try to make the argument, well, he was using the pre 55, and it's like no, he was using 65 missiles, so he was using the Holy Week reform as well. This entire time as well, there was no. And then, by the way, you can see this in some pictures that are done in the early days of Econ as well. Um, and the fact is, people say, well, he allowed the pre-55 to be used or it was being used in SSPX places um, 
before 83. And it's like, the, the problem was the priests were learning it in their formation at Econ. And then when they were going out, they, some of them decided on their own authority, I'm going to do a pre-55. But in fact, they were not supposed to do that. And Archbishop Lefebvre began quickly to correct this issue by saying, we're not supposed to be doing this. And this is, by the way, with the nine in America, this is part of that process where he's telling them, you need to follow the 62 liturgical books. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is our proper reaction to the post-conciliar liturgical crisis. We're not going to just recreate liturgical anarchy by picking and choosing what we want to follow. No, we're going, this is what we should be doing because the Pope legitimately implemented this, promulgated this. There's nothing heterodox in it. It's completely orthodox. Therefore, according to the principles of authority in liturgical matters, as given by Mediator Day in Pius XII's encyclical of 1947 on sacred liturgy, plus class presidents, and also the matters of proper interpretation of authority, and he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, we are obliged to follow these reforms. And it's first and foremost a matter of authority that's predicated on the faith. Because what it comes down to is we're only allowed to disobey regarding the Novus Ordo Mise because it impinges the faith, because it's heterodox. And as Archbishop Lefebvre says, it poses a danger to the faith. By the way, this is also the same point is made in the Atiyavani intervention, the so-called Atiyavani intervention. Its real title is A Brief Critical Study in the Order of the Mass, which was chaired by Archbishop Lefebvre with 10 guys in Rome. Um, and Atiyavani uh, and Cardinals Adiovani and Bacci both wrote the preface for this, by the way. And, and in this, the conclusion of their preface to this work is that the Novus Ordo Mise does not intend either in whole or in part to conform with the dogmas as given by the Council of Trent regarding the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Well, that's a really serious problem. And at the end, they said, this new Mass is going to cause a tragic situation for the faithful. Well, what is that tragic situation? Well, this new mass being imposed to, to replace the traditional mass, what are Catholics going to do? Now they have this liturgy that's heterodox. It's, that's, it's economical in its foundation. And this was done on purpose with the, with the integral assistance of six Protestant ministers, which have been proven beyond a doubt that they were intricately involved, intimately involved. They were not just on the perimeter there, kind of, you know, we got an opinion here. No, they were actually taking what these guys said and implementing it. Um, so there's lots of evidence on that as well, too. Um, so this is what the real problem is, because what's the motivation for the Holy Week reform? What's the motivation for the other reforms Pius XII undertakes, like the reform of the calendar for the new code of rubrics that comes out posthumously in 1960, et cetera, et cetera. The first thing we have to say is mo a lot of this most of this goes back to the Council of Trent itself that desired many of these reforms. It just wasn't able to undertake them in that time frame. If you understand what the situation of liturgical books was at the time of the Council of Trent, first thing you had to do was get these books standardized, codified, um, and and then get them, you know, being used everywhere where the Roman Mass was. Be that in itself was an enormous task. Before Saint Pius X, three other popes had kind of tried to attempt to go back to doing a general reform of the Roman liturgy and this wide sweeping general reform. Okay. Council Trent does some reforms. It's not a general reform as we would consider today, but there was talk about it by that committee. So the liturgical commission that the council of Trent commissioned to do all these things, was talking about these things. And some of them are talked about during the during Trent itself. And then during the next 300 years, there are attempts or thoughts to do this. It doesn't really get off the ground. There's a huge amount of work that had to be done. It gets interrupted because of all the social upheavals that occurs in Western Europe. Um, the papacy itself is under attack temporally, uh, militarily. And then finally get to St. Pius X, he announces his intention to carry out a general reform of the Roman liturgy in 1913. He dies in 1914, just a few months later, after the outbreak of World War I, breaks his heart. And 
we re now after World War II, we have in as, as early in 1946, we have Pius XII saying, I want to explore the idea again of attempting a general reform of the Roman liturgy. This is studied. They come back. He forms the Pian Liturgical Commission, which then begins all this work. So we really have a whole lineage of these things. So, for instance, regarding the calendar and classification systems, trying to simplify, trying to restore the temporal, the primacy of the temporal cycle, et cetera, et cetera, cleaning out the calendar, making this classification easier to follow. The, there's nothing new about this. And in one of the articles on liturgical documents, um, they're talking about the breviary reform, which is directly uh, integral to this discussion of this matter. Um, so none of this stuff is new. And by the way, even Pius, St. Pius V, there's talk, there's, there's, there's things that are said that even he, in his, when they were talking about doing a general form, which they never did, they're talking also about approaching the Holy Week. They're not just talking about certain things. They're talking about everything, okay? So, you know, this is long in coming, um, these kind of things. And the motivation here is several fold. So the first one is these things have been long overdue. They want to return back a certain sort, a certain sense of, Romanitas, simplicity, tierceness. This is the hallmark of, of Roman things. You know, some of these ceremonies are considered superfluously long because they've got all these imports from the Gallican Rite, which is quite embellished, coming from the influences of the Byzantine Rite itself. Okay. So um, there's talk of that. There's talk also about active participation. What is meant by that? It's not merely vocally, it's also symbolically by saying what is most important in these ceremonies and how have these these primary signs or symbols or lessons of faith been obscured by these additional things that were accreted over time accretions over time many of them from the middle middle medieval period when this was very popular very faddish to do all these things so they're, they're also talking about active participation, especially in promoting Holy Communion, reception of Holy Communion. We see this on Good Friday as an example, where they now say the faithful can go to communion on Good Friday, whereas before they'd been disallowed. Okay, um, So many levels of this active participation are being considered. Okay, And this notion of active participation at this time is completely orthodox. It's, exa it's traditional. It's a traditional form of active participation that used to exist, unfortunately died out, got killed out because of the social upheaval, destroying all these liturgical centers of life, mainly the monasteries and abbeys where people would, you know, Gregorian chant almost died out as a result as well. So these are these are both right. singing. These are all um, victims of this. Because, by the way, regarding the dialogue mass, we have the historical evidence mainly through letters of ambassadors writing back to their home countries, talking about what the dialogue mass practice was or isn't, where they're being posted compared to what they were used to at home. They're talking about this. Um, no, no, just, just, just so I'm clear, when you talked about uh, trimming down accretions, more active participation, are you talking about that was discussed around Trent at that time when we talk about general general reform no 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 well okay. so the, well the act of participation wasn't so much an issue at this time because this is when the dialogue mass was occurring this is when congregational king singing was still for the most part occurring it's after this period oh okay post now have where christendom is basically just almost to give you an example how bad it was before Pre-Reformation pre England, which is pre-Reformation Europe, continental Europe, okay, 1,500 monasteries and abbeys in continental Europe and England. And by the way, England had more abbeys and monasteries per ratio than all of Europe combined, okay? That's how saturated England was with religious orders and houses. Dom Garanger arrives at Salems, the ruined Salems in the 1830s, 
There's only 15 abbeys left in continental Europe. This is, this is what had happened. This directly affected the liturgical life of the clergy and the laity alike. Things had, in a sense, gone stagnant. And this is mentioned by um, various liturgical authors. Even Pius XI mentions this issue in Divini Cultus, uh, uh, his uh, document on the liturgy of, of 1928, okay? Apostolic Constitution, 1928. Now, 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 let me just ask one quick question ben, before we were in the post-revolutionary period. You said that at Trent, there was a call for a general reform of the liturgy. Uh, because when I, when, I read, uh, uh, Elkowin, when I read Elkowin Reed, Organic Development of the Liturgy, he says that 1570, Pius, the, Pius V, he accomplishes what Trent wanted him to do by yeah, doing... Reform, what okay. they're talking about, uh, so what they're talking about, Trent at this time, what Trent... So the fathers of the council are requested, or the fathers of the council request, basically uh, standardization and codification of the Roman books. This is part, again, a long process going all the way back, you know, where, where basically bishops want to imitate what the Pope is doing in Rome, where King Pepin wants to impose Roman-style chant on the Frankish kingdom. Charlemagne says, I want the Roman books. Okay, yeah. that's what I want. I don't want the, 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 the Gallican rite anymore. Um, so this is a long lineage. So what they're asking for for a general reform at this time is just to get the books in order. But there are other talks of other things talking about as well. And to put this into perspective, so when we talk about the reform of these liturgical books, I, I laugh when people like to say, well, the Holy Week reform was carried out hastily. And it's like, okay, well, first thing is the commission officially got started in 1947 and the first thing that came out was 1951 which was the easter vigil you're talking about one ceremony for one night that they had to work on for several for basically four to five years now by the way there have been a lot of preliminary research already being done articles published scholarly works i mean so this, there's it's not like oh so we got some so we got to now go into all these museums and research all that no it already been a lot of this has already been done spoken of and discussed ideas promoted okay so there's nothing new what people forget is when the council when the liturgical commission of trent so the first thing they worked on was the breviary because the breviary the calendar of the breviary was out of sync with the calendar of the missal and by the um. way the entire Julian calendar was outdated, and that was yes. another major thing that right. they discussed at the Council of, Trent of Reforming. This is where we get the Gregorian reform of the calendar that's used to this day. By the way, the Julian calendar goes back to Julius Caesar. Literally, it was his reform of the old ancient Roman calendar. It worked for a long time, and then, well, they, they thought the earth was, or they thought the orbits were perfectly round. They're more like an ellipsis. That's the reason why it went off track. Anyways, they spent eight years working on reforming the breviary. Does that, that seems like a little, quite a short time when you consider four volumes of the breviary, how much there is to work on, etc. The Missal, they only spent five. The entire Roman Missal was five years. Now compare five years for the Easter Vigil coming out in 1951 as an experimental usage, which was very successful. And then going, waiting all the way up until 1955 when they finally promulgate the Holy Week reform. You've got a much longer period. And by the way, they had more materials to work with with the Peon Liturgical Commission, whereas the Council of Trent, they did in fact go back to what they had at the Vatican archives, but it wasn't as extensive as what was obtained much later, especially in the 19th century when we start finding all these um, liturgical documents, sources that were previously unavailable. And by the way, I think what Council of Trent did was fantastic. They did a great a great amount of work for what they did. Um, and then after this, we see now the other books, whether it's the Pontificale Romanum, which did not really exist the way it had before. Um, we have the Rituale Romanum, which was not actually imposed. It becomes the model for all the other rituals, but it's not technically uh, imposed as you must follow this, though it becomes the model for everywhere else. Okay, um, so we have these various, they had to get these liturgical books hammered in shape, and that took some time. The 
development of the, or sorry, the development, the founding of the Sacred Congregation of Rights um, as, as an entity, as a body. Now we have an actual formal body that's dealing with liturgical questions. They're also dealing, by the way, with canonizations, beatification. That was part of their um, brief at that time as well. So we have all this going on. So in this respect, yes, there's that general reform of that and imposing a single standardized missile on the entire Latin church was was huge, okay? That being said, some of these things we're talking about, like the classification reforms to the calendar, to the rub to general rubrics. Um, also, we're talking about, mm, there's some things with this Holy Week. Oh, there's, there's talk about this, okay? Whether or not it's in the, in the concept of, we need to do a general reform, that is something possibly else. That's more of a matter of semantics, you might say. But going forward, again, if you look at the breviary reform, you see in regards to the breviary, they're already talking about doing a general reform of this, an overhaul. But they just, because anytime you deal with the breviary, you're dealing with the missile. And by the way, that's going to impinge Holy Week too, by the way. So there's all these things tied together with doing the breviary. And it was you know, finally, you get someone like St. Pius X, and, and, and here's here's the interesting thing about St. Pius X and the breviary reform. One of the things that really motivates him to undertake this, so basically, I mean, and he also, by the way, pushed forward the um, the codification of canon law. If To get a sense of what that meant, I mean, I understood it was an enormous project and undertaking. I didn't really practically understand how enormous that was until I went into the library at Benedictine College at Atchison and they have the special archive collection with all the old books. Well, you walk in and literally they have the shelves that are nine feet tall and they're about, I don't know, 10, 15 feet long. And there were like four of these stacked with all these huge antiquarian books by Cajetan, Soir, you name it. This is what they used to use for teaching canon law. And Pius X took this and codified it in a single volume. Massive, enormous amount of work there. So you can consider this with the breviary as well. And the thing that's really motivating him for the breviary is his priests. I think what people forget about St. Pius X, he was a priest among priests. He, he really was. He was a pastor of souls. He was, a, you know, he, he, he wasn't, you know, this is what's really motivating him is his pastoral solicitude. And there's already, by the way, a shortage of priests in his time. People don't remember. I mean, we don't have as many priests in 1903 as we did in 1456. There's a lot less priests available to us now. And their duties as pastors has been um, increased as well too, okay, in many ways as, as a result. And this breviary is literally crushing these priests who are like, I, I barely have time to do the breviary. And on top of it, they're having to do the little office of Blessed Virgin Mary, perhaps, the little office of dead include. It's just killing them. And they're, they're really getting nothing out of this breviary because they're just rushing through just to try to get through it as quickly as they can. So I can go do a sick call. Or I got to prepare my sermon or, you know, whatever it's going to be, you know. So St. Pius X is really motivated by we've got to make this. This breviary has been crushing our priests for hundreds of years. We have had lots of complaints about this. It's time to get it done. And he just pushes it through with the, with the level of determination of this man who, this incredible pope. And, and, and there's many other ways he does this too, you know, going head to head against modernism and exposing it for what it is. Okay. Um, and one must only wonder what his general reform of the Roman liturgy would have accomplished. Um, and I have to say in many ways, I would say it'd have to be pretty similar to what Pius XII did, because again, a lot of these ideas are not necessarily new. Okay. Um, in that respect. Okay. So we get up to Pius XII. Again, what's the motivation here? It's to bring these rites out into greater relief, to get the faithful to attend them more frequently. So the biggest, the biggest thing, by the way, of active participation that I neglected to mention is the restoration of the proper times. This is a big part of active participation because now 
because we are celebrating these uh, liturgical rites at the proper times in which they were in the ancient days, now the faithful can actually attend them. Uh, as an example, Easter Vigil, it was done on Saturday morning, and they used to complain that only, you know, old men and women and children could actually attend it because all the guys are off at work. Well, now that's in the evening, most men can actually. Same thing with the with the evening of the um, uh, the evening uh, uh, Holy Thursday. Last Supper for Holy Thursday. Yeah. So there's all these things that are that are that are involved here. Um, the biggest there's some principles we need to really well understand here regarding liturgical reform. And so the first thing is that older is not necessarily better because maybe for the Middle Ages, but for our times, you know, it might not be quite as adaptable. Okay. Also, longer is not better, especially if you understand the Roman character that is intended to infuse the Roman mass. That's what makes it Roman. It's not just merely Latin. It's the characteristic of Romanitas. And part of that is this tierce, brief style or method of doing things. Okay. So there's another thing they're trying to, to, to bring back. Okay. And God can draw straight with crooked lines is number three, what I like to say. And in that respect, I think it's been pretty well demonstrated, or I should say been proven that the Bunini myth that he was the architect of what happened to Pius XII has been completely demolished, okay? Was he in the room? Yes. He did his job as a secretary should at that time. His job later on Pope Paul VI under the Concilium is a completely different matter, and that's because Paul VI allowed this bureaucratic anarchy to occur. And there were different principles being used by the Concilium as well, too. But going to Pius XII, the, the best one that just came out recently is the publication of Father Charles Muir's book, um, uh, The Godmother, uh, Madre Pascalina, a, a, a Tour de Force of Feminism. And in there, she's absolutely explicit. Um, when Brunini published his autobiography, La Reforma Liturgica, she is like, absolutely not. Brunini was not the motivator. He was not the principal instrument. It, this was the Holy Father's work from start to finish. And Cardinal Antonelli's diaries also shows this. Yves Charon's um, biography of Annabali Bionini also implies this as well. There were oral testimonies going on even before all this. Um, so the point is, we have these testimonies. You cannot call it a Bionini Holy Week. Okay, you cannot. It's you cannot. You cannot call it a Benini sixty-two missile. No. And going another again, God can draw straight with crooked lines. Even if Bunini was, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, is there anything unorthodox in these reforms up to the sixty-two missile? The answer is absolutely no. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even if Bunini was there or not. And in fact, Michael Davies once, so for instance, when the whole thing blew up that Bunini was a Freemason, and then this became kind of a, a rallying call for those against the new mass. Michael Davies decried this approach to opposing the new mass. And he said, I wish, I almost wish that this revelation about Bunini had never come out, had never surfaced, because it doesn't matter whether he was a Freemason or not. What, and it doesn't matter whether he, he was even involved in the liturgy or not. What matters is what was done to the liturgy. It's not a question of who did it. It's a question of what was done and why it was done. Now, of course, so, we can go to Bunini for testimony, what was done, Pope Paul VI and, and others, okay? We can also even go back to Father Louis Boyer, who's resigning his commission on the Concilium because he says, right. this is not traditional what you're doing, Holy Father, and I will have no part of it. it. It lacks organic development. Okay. We can say that about the reforms of Pius XII. You cannot, by the way, it's absolutely ridiculous to say Pius XII, who defines what antiquarianism is. By the way, antiquarianism wasn't new. The Council of Pistola was trying to do this as well. The Synod of Pistola was right. trying to do this. Antiquarianism is not new. He defines and condemns it in Mediatra Day in 1947. 
You're going to tell me in 1951 and then later in 55, he now breaks his own principles. That's ridiculous. Anybody who knows anything about Pope Pius XII knows this was a man who was strong in the faith, strong in principles, defended Christian Europe to the hilt against every single enemy that could possibly be thrown at him at that time for the for the period of his of his sovereign reign. You know, this is a man who stood up against errors. And even when he was sick, they did try to say, well, he was sick. And no, even when he was sick, he was holding firm to what was going on. This is anybody who knows Pius XII and knows his character. This is a slur against his character. And, um, you know, this is ridiculous. And on top of it, it's not antiquarianism. Yes, they go back and say, look, what they're saying is these are medieval accretions. These medieval accretions obscure the main and primary symbolism or lesson that should be there without going too much into details. But an example is the so-called triple reed and the Paschal candle. The triple reed was a merely a practical thing that was used to, talk, to light very tall Paschal candles that were immovable and could not, could not be moved. Okay, So they would take that from the Paschal fire and they would use that. Later, some people began to arbitrarily uh, give it some symbolism of the Holy Trinity, but that it really it wasn't even three spokes originally. It was just a twisted piece of candle, maybe of three candles wrapped together. Okay, but this was obscuring the very use of this triple reed was obscuring the primary symbolic role of the Paschal candle, which signifies Christ, the light of Christ, this pillar of light. Okay, the pillar of fire that led the Israelites out of bondage and through the Red Sea, which is a, form, a symbol of baptism, to redemption, the promised land, etc. So there, this, is, this triple reed is uh, an accretion from the Middle Ages that served a practical purpose. We don't need it anymore. We don't have Paschal candles that are 35 feet tall, okay, for the most part. So we don't need it. Let's remove it. And at the same time, Let's do some other things to bring out this past. Let's make some improvements, some additions, or restructure slightly what we're doing with the Paschal candle to bring out the glory of this primary symbol of the vigil. Another thing that they do, which I love, is the addition of the renewal of the baptismal promises. Catholics are beginning to forget who they are as Christians. Okay. So the idea is you need to live your baptismal promises every day of the year. Ne we never get to renew our baptismal promises because they were, for most of us, they were made when we were infants. Now we get to do it as adults with our full will and reason and intellect. And, you know, this is a beautiful thing where the church realizes what's appropriate for our time and saying we need to bring the sense back of who we are as baptized Christians, as members of the mystical body of Christ. So, you know, here's some examples here where with the Paschal candle, yes, they bring out some older things. They add some newer things. You know, the example here is Pope St. Gregor the Great and what he does with the canon of the mass about 600, 610 AD. The famous quotation is he added a little, took away a little and rearranged a little. And this is the precedence that can be done to these accidental or non-essential matters of the liturgy or elements of the liturgy. The liturgy is not a fly trapped in amber. It wasn't since Gregor the Great. It wasn't since the Council of Trent or any of those revisions made, by the way, 30 years, 30 years after that, or even under St. Pius X or even up to 55. The liturgy is, is always available to undergo revisions. And you can look at it as a, as a tree. You know, sometimes you need to prune a tree so it can grow even healthier. Okay. This is what the liturgy has constantly been undergoing since day one. And, and some of these guys act like Jesus Christ gave the 55 missile to the apostles and said, here you go. Don't change it. It's carved in stone. No. And it's not antiquarianism to go back and say, here's some things that we could possibly do that help us to do this. Antiquarianism is where we're hankering after these things because we don't like what's been done with the development, okay? 
So as an example, a form of antiquarianism, let's get rid of genuflections. It's a later development of the Roman mass. Let's go back to just bowing, which in fact, this is what they do in the Novus Ordo to placate Protestants and Orthodox because neither like genuflecting. Okay. All right. Protestants don't like genuflecting because it shows that the reality, this is Jesus Christ. It is a real presence. We adore him. It's not, well, we can accept the bow because that's just a symbol. We accept that that's a symbol of Jesus. Okay. If you want that communion wafer to be a symbol of Jesus, we accept that. Okay. The Orthodox, we don't like genuflecting because it's Roman. No, we don't like Roman. We don't like your Latin rites. Okay. So there's a specific example where they do an anti a form of antiquarianism. Okay. And, 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 and for those who want to accuse um, Pius XII of doing antiquarianism, not only A, it's ridiculous to say the very Pope who condemned this is now doing it. B, what are they actually restoring and in what way are they doing it? How are they doing this? You know, and is it doing it to somehow diminish our belief as Catholics? No. Every single time in the Novus Ordo, when they want to um, use the air of antiquarianism, it's for an ecumenical agenda. Okay. Whether and it's to diminish our faith, as an example, using this so called liturgy of Hippolytus. In the third century, there's nothing wrong with this liturgy. After the Protestant Reformation, it's a problem because it doesn't properly define all these dogmas that Council of Trent has raised up, which the Roman Mass has always been considered as a bulwark against these Protestant errors on the, the issue of the dogma surrounding the what is the Holy Sacrifice of Mass, the unbloody renewal of Calvary, on the sacred priesthood. Yes, a priest can, in fact, transubstantiate matter. Okay. Uh, uh, let me ask a question, Louis. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Now, the one of the things that concerned me about 55 is that there are pious customs of the faithful for Holy Week, the holiest week of the year, obviously, when most of the many of the faithful are attending things. For example, Tenebrae is in the evening and there's customs regarding the lights and there's other pious customs of the faithful worldwide, uh, all sorts of devotions, devotional practices that are all tied in with the Holy Week as it existed before 55. Is not the 55. No, here, here, let me, let me, um, here, here's a, an alternative. Could they not have, uh, introduced an optional Holy Week that had different times and things like that without doing violence to the pious customs? They could introduce it in the cathedral or, you know, as an option instead of disallowing all these cherished customs of the faithful by changing all the times. What do you think about that? So the principle is this, and in fact, uh, one of the things I have under liturgical documents, it's uh, actually, um, it's called Pastoral Extracts from the Rites of Holy Week, which is a manual that was done by uh, Frederick, Father Frederick McManus. Yes, I know later on he went bad, but his initial stuff is very good. And in there, between pages uh, 18 and 19, he um, covers this issue of popular devotions, which is addressed also, by the way, in the documents regarding um the pastoral issues of the liturgical reform. So they're well aware of this when they bring out, uh, promulgate the 55 Holy Week reform, okay? The first issue that we have to understand, the liturgy always takes precedence. It is the actual official expression of the church at prayer, publicly, communally. Devotions fall under this. And one of the things they, th that's really important to understand is these Pious devotions, as great as they are, like these wonderful Good Friday processions that they used to make, which they would make at the time that when our Lord died, well, that's because the Good Friday ceremonies have been pushed back so early in the morning. Now there was nothing to actually commemorate at the moment of our Lord's death. Well, they changed, they fixed this by moving the liturgy back to its proper time, which is where it once had been before. One of the things that they mention is how do we deal with these popular devotions that have grown up because they don't want to suppress devotion, but they want it properly orientated. They're like, look, the liturgy is the first and foremost thing. That is the devotion, the veneration of the cross. Okay. Um, those kind of things, the solemn intercessory prayers, etc. So one thing that could be done is that these, these devotions could be held either earlier in the day or later in the day after the Good Friday ceremonies okay so these these things could be done and in some cases they were 
Okay. So also Tenebrae, by the way. So Tenebrae originally was, if you're following the monastic practices, they start at 3.30 in the morning. It's Matt and the Lods. The whole thing with the candles was to illuminate the church so they could read, and they would gradually extinguish the candles as the sun was coming up. And by the time they got done with Lods, the sun was up. They didn't need it anymore for reading purposes. This is the whole history of the Tenebrae hearse or the, the triangular uh, candle stand that you see. Uh, that that That's the whole reason for it. And the word Tenebrae just means could come the darkness from one of the Psalms. It could also mean that it was being done in the dark, but every matins and lauds by monks were being done in dark. It just so happened that Tenebrae became a very popular thing for people to attend because now it's really trying to get ready for the passion of our Lord during the sacred tritium. Okay. And it's beautiful that people are, are, are going to this and everything and trying to do this. So, and with the, change now that's occurring. So for instance, one of the things that happens at the Easter Vigil. In the pre-55 Easter Vigil, it was concluded with Vespers. Well, that's because they're doing it at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now it's concluded with Lauds because it's being done. You're finishing about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. So rather than inquire priests to have to say all of Matins and Lauds, now they have this very short version of Lauds. So all they did is, okay, Vespers was already anticipated by these, well, they would already been done by these priests about five, six o'clock because you're not going to start the Easter vigil until the sun starts to go down at the very earliest, 9, 9 p.m., you know, 10, 10, 30 p.m., whatever it's going to be, okay? Um, so you've already done Vespers now. So it's just taking stock of the reality of the situation for the, for what the priests have to do for their divine office, okay? So, I don't know if that puts into greater perspective for you of what's going on here. Okay. Uh, and what about uh, the Easter vigil is originally 12 readings. It's reduced to, I believe, four in 55. Yes. Four. And then there's the Pentecost vigil, which is a bookend in Paschal Tide. You got the Easter vigil with 12 readings. You have the Pentecost vigil with 12 readings at the vigil of Pentecost. The Pentecost vigil is completely suppressed in 55. Mm -hmm. um, what are what are your thoughts on that? So first thing is, um, I would make mention there. Uh, there was actually a so a lot of people, the pre fifty fivers, want to go back and say, "Where's your liturgical precedence for doing this?" And the answer is, we don't necessarily need one. If the Pope says this is the way it's going to be, this is the way it's going to be. And in fact, this was done for centuries up to Pope Gregory the Great. So what's the problem? A pope still has that authority behind him to do that. And he can adjust these things according to the needs of the time. The Easter vigil has to be remembered that as a vigil, you're basically the first part where you had these 12 lessons is basically matins in the ancient times. Okay. Because the old, what uh, matins often was on Sundays in the ancient times, in the early church, they would gather together late at night, sing psalms, hymns, canticles, have sermons, whatever, okay? And by the way, the story of St. Paul with the boy falling out the window and dying, and he had to bless him and resurrect, this is part of that vigil service. And then finally, as they're getting closer to the dawn... <laughs> the boy died because it was too long. They had too many yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they weren't Roman yet. They weren't Roman. They were Eastern still, okay? And, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's I didn't imagine St. Paul probably giving a five-hour long sermon, okay? Um, um, anyways, um, so then they would begin the Holy Sacrifice to the Mass as the sun began to rise, as we get into dawn. This is the practice of matins and laws, and we see all that going on. We see some, the Easter Vigil is the last of the church's ceremonies that imitates that practice. And of course, it, now it's been gloriously restored to the proper time of being done in the evening over into the early morning versus doing it in the early morning. And also the other beautiful thing about this restoration of time was in the pre-55 Holy Week, by 1130, you're singing Alleluia. I can say that word now. I, I, I Before, I have to stop from such a which is my Sunday, I say the A word, okay? Um, but they could, they were singing Alleluia. Well, now the rest of the day, not only does the fast end before you even get to midnight, but now you're already basically rejoicing. With the restoration of the vigil time, 
you now only not only have that the whole the, one of the things that points they emphasize is that Holy Saturday is a day of profound mourning and contemplation over our Lord resting in the tomb. They have put him in the tomb and they've walked away in sorrow. And there he is. And we're all sorrowing that he's in the tomb. And this whole day is also a day of fast and abstinence all the way up until the vigil. And in fact, if you don't go to the vigil, you don't get the party unless you go to a, an Easter Sunday morning mass first. Okay. So this is this beautiful emphasis they put back as well. Now, the regarding the Pentecost vigil, Dom Garanger explains in the liturgical year, this is simply a uh, repeat of the vigil because of those who were absent, who could not come to the vigil to be baptized. It's a repeat for those who are going to get baptized. So their catechetical instruction had it ended. I don't know, they got sick, who knows, whatever. So they would repeat it. Well, by the time we get to the 40s and 50s, let alone the 20th century, we're not even doing these really like this anymore, okay? So it's like, it's deemed that we don't need to do this practice. We don't need to un unnecessarily repeat this anymore, okay? Because we don't have the same situation going on. In the, in the earlier times of the church, yes, we could see how this was important to do, okay? Um, but these ceremonies have already been done. Now, regarding 12 lessons versus four, um, there actually is a, what I meant to say, you know, historical precedents. The Pope could just do it if he wants to. He could reduce this number to one if he wanted to. He could just get rid of them completely if he wants to, okay? The point is, it's reduced to four. There is a precedence that some areas were only doing four lessons versus 12. The reason for 12, again, it's imitating matins, how many lessons you're going to have there, okay? without the individual chapters and all that stuff going on, um, the, the blessing that occurs between each lesson, et cetera. Okay, the prophecies, if you want to call them. So they chose four of them, what they considered to be the four most important ones. And they also do this to reduce the amount of time. Okay, for anybody who says, well, I want 12 lessons, you go ahead and sit through 12 lessons. Go ahead, be my guest. Go ahead. Okay, but they not only kept the four lessons, they also kept these gorgeous canticles as well and 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 the prayer so it's just a slight restructuring and there's nothing wrong with this okay and the church has the right to do these things to adopt these things according to our times okay so and it can choose which lessons it wishes to keep or choose and, and you're not gonna by the way for anybody who says well these lessons absolutely needed to be there and it's like do you find them in every single liturgical rite throughout the church the answer is no okay the answer is no. So every right had its own way of developing things. And there's different ways that they do things. And some of it, some of things are very similar and some things are very quite different. Okay. What's being done. Um, so in any case, so that's, that's what's going on there with the, with the lessons. And for those who say, well, Benini realized his mistake as he writes in his autobiography. If you can take, by the way, what he says verbatim and that he's not actually lying to us. Cause we know there's several times he's lying to us in his autobiography. The first one is he tries to take credit for what he did for the Holy Week reform. And of course, this has been completely debunked. Okay. He also tries to say, I introduced mass facing the people by having them um, face the people when they bless the palms. That's blessing palms. That's not saying mass. That's not one of the same thing. You can't make the same uh, parallel there. But he also tries to say, well, I realized we made a mistake by removing um, these lessons so I put them back. I think his, I think better said his motivation was, I want to ecumenically please the Protestants. We're all about scripture, 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 and we don't have enough scripture. So let's put it back. I think that's more of a motivation more than anything, because we know that's one of the major things is pushing uh, the Nova Sordos, why we have a three cycle lectionary, which is absolutely ridiculous for which there is absolutely no precedence anywhere. Okay. Um, there's a lot of eschatological reasons that are behind us dumbing down the eschatological ends as well too, to all this. So, um, you know, and, and by the way, in these matters, I know that I see eye to eye with my pre 55, uh, confreres. Okay. I've called them because I, I don't wish to be, uh, have any animosity with them in this, in this respect. I mean, we disagree. Um, I think these are is a very important point, but I think there's a lot of things we, we tend to agree on more than disagree, to be honest. And I know we would 
to have, tend to all agree on this point, okay, that um, th that this whole issue of sacred scripture, um, and in fact, a, a friend of mine, Stephen Wallier, one of the talks he gave a few years ago was on how the lectionary um, naturally was the first ecumenical effort of the Novus Ordo, of the Novus Ordo bringing together these Protestant ministers to develop this new lectionary for the new mass. And a funny thing that happens though, is even though the Lutherans are involved, they go their own way. They end up not taking what the Catholics developed verbatim and said, you know, we're not totally satisfied with everything they did. Let's, let's build on what they did. It's kind of interesting in that respect um, that they, that even they were like totally unsatisfied with what we Catholics came up with. All right. But I, well, I would say, yeah, I, I don't think you can ascribe directly that Bunini said, well, it was a mistake and therefore it proves it was a mistake for them to remove it under Pius XII. I, I don't think you can make that conclusion at all. And mm -hmm. I'm quite happy that it's only four lessons. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be extra extraordinarily long. We're not, especially in our day and age. And again, you know, it's not a Matin's office in this sense, it's the vigil, it's its own creature. Yes, it goes off a model of the Matins office, but it doesn't have to perfectly imitate that. Well, it, it seems like the from the very beginning, you, you broke down the main argument from Archbishop Lefebvre that this is the Pope's right to modify and reform the liturgy, even if there is no historical precedent because it is his authority. He can do so for a good reason uh, as long as it's not orthodox. And I, it's true. I, I think that's I think, I think one of your best points. Because I don't think anybody who's pre-55 has has claimed that the 62 is unorthodox in some way. Well, there have been some. Oh, okay. Yeah, there have been some on Facebook. Uh, and in, in fact, I've taken them to task on that. Um, I'm not going to say all of them. So, you know, you can't, I don't want to treat those who are, promoting this pre-55 is monolithic. There are certain things that they all pretty much kind of agree on, but they're not completely mon monolithic in their approach on this matter. Okay, so I, I don't want to like say, throw them all in the same basket and say every single one of them says that the 50, the 55 is heterodox, okay? Um, there's definitely some, well, we really should avoid it, and this is the beginning of the end, and it's the thin edge of the, you know, the thin of the wedge, and like, no, that's that's called the era of gradualism because there is a clear demarcation when we go from non-modernism to modernism. There is no modernism. There are no modernist principles at play with these reforms to the 62 Missal. And if anybody is going to denounce this, it's going to be Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. I mean, not that he's the end all. And, and that's why I think people misunderstand. When I quote or hold him up... I'm quoting him because he's upholding the principle that's taught by the popes on, you know, liturgical reform the regarding authority on St. Thomas Aquinas. We have the actual thing where he actually kicked out nine priests over this matter. That's how serious this is to him. Okay. This is how serious this is to him. Um, it's, it's not a matter of option. It's no, this is what we must do. This is our proper approach and reaction to the post-conciliar crisis, we must avoid falling into liturgical. And, and this is the problem with liturgical anarchy. Now we got people, oh, I would just want to do this. I want to do that. I want to cherry pick this and cherry pick that. And this is a problem. And it, it's interesting because less than 10 years ago, everyone knew they were supposed to be following the 62 liturgical books. Everyone knew that. And there were a few people and that were coming out and saying, well, and most of them were considered as cooks, cooks, you know, I mean, it was, it was basically the state of a conscious and a few people in the mainstream, but everyone pretty much also um, identified this as a state of a conscious matter and as an, a direct attack against the SSPX, which happens to be their enemy number one, usually for whatever reason, because it's a state of a con and it's a society St. Pius X that's really opposed the error state of a conscious more than anyone else. OK, because, mm -hmm. again, they have a great fidelity to the Holy See, no matter, you know, and they've always said, look, we accept Pope John Paul II as the Holy as the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, even Pope Francis. We accept him as the Supreme Pontiff. Not that I am SSPX, but I support their position in these matters because they're the Catholic. This is the Catholic, you know, 
way of following things. Okay, they're they're very good on on these theological matters, very good on these philosophical matters. Um, and 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 do they always perfectly a hundred percent practice what they preach? Well, no. Okay, there's certain things that I I disagree. As an example, I disagree with their bishops using the pontifical throne. They're auxiliary bishops; they have no business doing that. Archbishop Lefebvre, yes, he could. There's there's some there's precedence for that. He would have been allowed under under rules of charity to have done that. Basically, he could have applied for it to the local bishop and they would have said yes. And they always did in the old days. OK, and that's what he said. And by the way, he was actually granted use of the throne by the Bishop of Sion, in which the seminary of Icon exists. The bishop there said, you're allowed to use the throne in your seminary. I give you my permission. Use it all the time, anytime you want to. But the auxiliary, they, they basically just kept on carrying on ceremonial with the, what everyone was used to doing with the archbishop. The archbishop was still alive. They didn't, MCs didn't want to have to learn two different ways of doing pontifical mass of throne, pontifical mass of the false school. By the way, what is happening now is it's happening a little more frequently where the, the SSPX bishops are doing pontifical mass at the false stool. Um, by the way, when Bishop Fillet was in Rome back in for the Jubilee, what did they do? Absolutely used the false stool to recognize that the Pope is the Pope. He is the Supreme Bishop. He is uh, the Bishop of Rome. And, and so they absolutely did it for that. Okay. But like I said, there's little, little inconsistencies here and there. Um, I'm not a party man by any means. Uh, people think, oh, you're just SSPX. I'm like, no, I just, I'll agree with them where, you know, but I'll disagree where I'm going to disagree as All well. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, Lewis, I, what are we expecting of your time? It's almost 3.15 Central. Uh, so thanks so much for presenting um, a lot of this important argumentation to dispute about this. Um, and so viewers, you can go to, the, he has two hours worth of broadcasting over at Jess Kastman's channel, going into more details on those all these issues. Uh, so I'm glad we could, we could go a little bit on this when it's not the context of Holy Week. Yes. Um, so... Thanks for the conversation, Lewis. Let's end with a Hail Mary, uh, and then we can offer this up to God through Our Lady. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Amen.